All right, hey guys. Uh, so right here I have Steve Hall from Revive Stronger, or as Jared Feather would say, Steve Hall. But Steve is one of the first, in, like, Steve has this YouTube channel, and it's this wealth of bodybuilding information where Steve has been able to talk to head researchers in exercise science, nutrition science, um, all over, like a very, very diverse portfolio. Um, Steve is one of the main reasons why I kind of got introduced to the whole evidence-based fitness scene with Mike Isretel, uh, Eric Helms, Brad Schoenfeld, um, and a vast other number of prolific re researchers and exercise scientists in the field. Um, Steve is a natural bodybuilder, um, very, and uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> you want to talk about yourself? <laughs> No, I mean, it's it's awesome to hear that I kind of introduced you to the evidence-based sphere, as it were, and people like Mike Isretel, Eric Helms, because, yeah, I was lost until I found that. And I was like, I don't know, doing all these different diets. I was trying all these different training programs. I just didn't understand the backbone, the science behind any of it, the principles. And so that's why kind of Revive Stronger is a, a, obviously we coach people. That's the main thing we do as a company also as a content provider is education it's just trying to get spread the science spread the word out there and get closer to the truth and bring people on who can discuss ideas and who are smarter than i'll ever be but then i can take some of that knowledge apply it to clients and be a better coach so yeah it's uh, that's yeah well yeah me in a nutshell i am a natural bodybuilder um not a wmbf pro yet uh, like we talked about offline yeah. but i yeah. the best i've done is a top five placing at the uk dfba uh, international finals in 2017 but i probably have gained maybe at most 10 pounds of stage weight on top of that that fits sounds ridiculous because muscle gain is so slow but i mean if i'm very ambitious maybe 10 pounds next time i'm on stage i'll be in the low 170s versus the low 160s uh, which is amazing uh, and yeah, yeah so that the, the pro card is not i don't think completely out of question now which if you ask me years ago it would have been so i'm i'm a okay natural bodybuilder um better coach and content provider probably well only time will really tell um, unfortunately with the whole of, of, of the world it's kind of tough for anybody to do that much of anything related to anything with with sports it's been it's weird when you look at like some of the baseball games here in america and there's nobody there it's just the players. It's like, okay. Creepy. But, uh, Scary. Yeah, so Steve is a uh, – Steve – yeah, I, I I said this on my on my story, but something I really look up to with, with Steve is just his whole ability to kind of play the long game. And I kind of wanted to talk with you about your past masking experience when you did hit – push your body weight up to 200 pounds. Um what led into um that experience that decision to actually push your body weight and what do you think the importance is of pushing body weight to new into new highs um as a bodybuilder who's looking to um especially natural bodybuilders um who are looking to get the most muscular mm -hmm. as possible because uh, like you're talking off air many natural bodybuilders don't like to push their body weight that high. And that's just because of the whole theory of some bot uh, natural bodybuilders that, well, muscle gain is so slow. Why push it? Um, Steve, do you have any insight on to that? Yeah, I think a really good starting point will probably be my previous massing phases before that one. And uh, they kind of helped me come to the conclusion that mm, they didn't go so well. Why didn't they go so well? Well, actually, my first mass phase, um, I, it's funny, I kind of flip-flopped. So, And probably many of the listeners have done something similar where you first hear of massing, bulking, you're just like, all right, seafood diet, I'll eat all the food, I'm going to gain all the muscle, and it, it doesn't happen like that. Even if you eat, quote-unquote, clean food, you're not gaining pure body, ma uh, body muscle. It's just not happening. You're going to gain a bunch of fat. So my first mass phase, I gained a lot of fat. Um, and... It, 
unnecessarily because I was very new to lifting. So I could have just milked out lots of muscle gain without the needless kind of fat gain on top of it. So I massed the first time I massed up, I hit 190 pounds. And then I cut down to, I can't even remember now, but I cut down and I got quite lean. Uh, but I was like, man, I didn't like being that fat. I, and my, my body is not made to be that fat. It was, I remember being there and it was super uncomfortable and I, I really didn't like it. So then I was like, okay, All right, this is when I started to become more educated. I started finding people like Alan Aragon, La McDonald, bodyrecomposition.com, reading everything. I was just digesting every little bit I could. Came across Matt Ogus, my 3D muscle journey, started looking at their stuff and said, like, oh, so these guys are much more conservative in their mass gaining phases. Like they're gaining, I don't know, like a, a couple of pounds a month or something, or maybe even just a pound when you're more advanced. So I was like, okay, this sounds better. Like I can lean gain. I can just like gain slowly, just gain muscle hopefully and not gain any fat. And so I, I kind of attempted that and I ended up spinning my wheels for quite a while. I feel like where I essentially, I, I did compete in 2014. And after that to 2017, when I next competed, I think I only pushed my body weight up to at most 185 pounds, like the mid 180s. And I compete at like 160 pounds is my lightest. That's 15 pounds above stage. That's not a fat individual. Um, and that is not pushing body weight very high. And so I would kind of like push up, like get a bit uncomfortable in the low 180s and then cut down to the mid 170s. And I just kind of cycle up and down. It was essentially like a bit of a like binge purge yo-yo diet in a sense. It wasn't that it was like that. It was just I gained so slowly. I'd maybe gain a pound a month. And I was just really kind of, I called it, and I wrote some articles uh, calling it adipose phobia, kind of fat phobia. I was kind of scared of the fat gain. And I was like, the fat gain's the thing that's yeah, holding me back. So when I comp competed in 2017, I'm actually now looking back, kind of surprised how much I'd improved to 2000, 2014 because I really held myself back in that off season. And actually that contest prep, um, in 2017 was when I started applying more of the principles I'd learned from Mike Isratel. So the volume landmark, landmarks, I'd started actually implementing a little bit of twice daily training. I think I grew some of that contest prep, uh, which is awesome. And it just goes to show when you start nailing things, yeah. even if you've been training many years, you can grow even in a deficit potentially. So yeah, I started doing that. And then it was, like you said, come to the off season I've just had or the improvement season of 2017 to date basically where i then pushed my body weight all the way up to 200 pounds which is like 40 pounds above stage weight which is versus 15 a big big difference yeah um and yeah part of the thing that convinced me was my history it was a sense of okay so i've, I've gone too fast I've, i call it a folk a fat bulk where you just gain lots of fat and uh, not too much muscle and then i also did kind of the mysterious lean gains approach where i just kind of spam my wheels and I didn't really change very much. So I so there's got to be a nice middle ground. And uh, I'd been obviously talking to Mike Isratel more and he kind of had a little bit of a different perspective of, he was a little bit more assertive. And I think when I first spoke to him, he was more assertive than he is now. And now Mike yeah. and Eric have kind of, I think they've even come on uh, my podcast and spoken about it and kind of, they, they have a little bit of a kind of disagreement that maybe Eric is a little bit below Mike and Mike is a little bit higher, but they're very close. So I started in that off season, just being a little bit more assertive, I'd say like a meaningful surplus. So I'd be looking to gain 1% uh, of additional body weight every two weeks, which is like over one and a, like one and a half to two pounds every two weeks. So like decent gains over the long term and um, implementing some mini cuts here and there to kind of reset appetite somewhat and also help phase potentiation get off a little bit of body fat to buy more time. That's kind of productive massing time. And I essentially kind of, yeah, pushed up, came down sometimes through mini cuts and it just looked like 200 pounds wouldn't look wrong. <laughs> it wouldn't be like I was way, way over fat. Um, and I probably hit 200 pounds and I actually think I hit like a high of 202 at a body fat that's maybe in like the high teens, but I definitely didn't push over 20%. Um, I'm in a position where luckily I like, I'm not, I've always found it hard to put on weight just generally as being like a skinny kid, but yeah, I managed to hit that body weight. And like, I, at the, and it's interesting when you're massing because you don't really know what's going on underneath. You just kind of like put it in the oven, put the, put the ingredients in the oven, let it bake. And then it's not till you cut down that you open the oven and you kind of see, okay, what's going on. So kind of hit that 200 pounds and started cutting down. And when, once I'd lost like the 10 pounds, then 20 pounds, I was like, wow, like there's some, new tissue under here that's really exciting um and i preface all of this saying 
and I always talk about how like nutrition is only permissive of the training stimulus that you provide. If your training's dog shit, it doesn't matter what you eat, you're not going to be gaining muscle. So the, the training is the kind of the match that lights the fire to muscle gain. And then kind of the nutrition is just the, the sticks, the fuel, the, the petrol that's keeping it going. Uh, so I would never want anyone to get that misconstrued. But I think once you've got your training really in a good place and you're really pushing it. And like, for me, I take this incredibly seriously. Bodybuilding is more than uh, just like a side kind of passion. It's almost my career in a way in that it's so associated with what, what I do on a day-to-day basis with my clients and with the podcast and everything that Revive Stronger is. So I take it very seriously. So I want to make sure every little bit of work that I put in the gym is being paid off on the outside. So I know all my investment is coming back. So I'd prefer to be gaining every ounce of muscle than making any loss of that. And if I have to gain more fat for that, that's fine. I often use the analogy of building muscle is like cycling uphill. It's just hard. Why would you ever make it any harder than it needs to be? Let's make sure we're in a meaningful surplus because fat loss is like cycling downhill. It's just so much easier. Like we were talking about off air. It's just like, you just don't have to eat as much. I know it's much more complicated than that. But for us guys who have our like lives down, we kind of have our steps in place. Maybe we, we have all of that stuff in check. We know how to diet. It can come off like snap your fingers in a, a five weeks time. You could have lost almost 10 pounds for some people. They can just, it can just come off like that. So yeah, I, I kind of convinced myself that that's the way I need to go. The fat gain, I kind of got over it after a while. You kind of get the more you just keep going, you kind of get to a point where you're just like, well, now I'm just soft. So let's just keep going. <laughs> um, and I, I describe it to people that the, the kind of fat you gain is just the cost of doing business. Like nothing comes for free. It's just like you're dry. Like if you buy a new pair of shoes, like you're not going to get anywhere in life with those shoes if you don't walk around outside and get some dirt on them and stuff. And you can clean them up quickly and go out again. So it's just like that. So yeah, for me, it kind of coming to this improvement season, having kind of come across Mike's more meaningful surplus and then using that kind of alongside my history of I've done it too quick. I've done it too slow. Let's try this. And it just really worked incredibly well um, because yeah, in the past when I particularly, I encourage people not to try and gain too slowly or go really slow because if you're trying to gain a pound in a month, there's just no way you can measure that because your body weight fluctuates so much. Like I can remember months where I'd go up like two pounds in that month. I'd be like, Oh, that was a bit quick. I'll cut down a little bit. And then the next month I'd be like, Oh crap. At the end of this month, I'm down three pounds. It's like, what's going on here? I've just maintained nothing has really happened. Um, so yeah, whilst body recomposition is a real thing where you can be at maintenance galleries and you can gain muscle and potentially like even lose some fat for someone who's advanced, it's just so hard. And I'm like, I see people trying to do it and I'm like, so for you to do that, you have to nail, optimize everything, basically. And I'm just like, well, you've optimized everything. If you just put in a surplus, you've just given yourself such a stimulus for muscle growth and you could gain so much more if you'd done that. Why are you working so hard? Why are you so scared of fat when it is just so quick to come off? So yeah, that's kind of how I got to the position that I was in in that off season and uh, why I pushed up to 200 pounds. And actually to answer your question on hitting new highs, so it's funny that you said that because I did hit 190 pounds way back when, and then I never went higher than that for ages, for like years after it. And then so to hit 200 was a big deal for me. That's 10 pounds heavier than I've ever been. Um, and I think there is probably something to that, like attaining, I mean, obviously you want to hit body weights you've hit before, but at a leaner body composition, that's kind of a sign that you've gained muscle because now you're leaner when you're hitting that. But to hit new body weights, and I think a lot of, kind of natural bodybuilders don't like pushing to those big body weights uh, because it is uncomfortable. Um, I think a lot of people get comfortable. The kind of lean gains, marginal surplus or maintenance is really nice. <laughs> like we were yeah. talking off air, like maintenance is easiest to what the body wants to do. Um, but I always like the, the kind of the quote, challenge, without challenge, there is no change. And your off season improvement season needs to be challenging, not just in the weight room. You need to be on top of your nutrition. Um, I think a lot of people don't make the most out of their improvement season. Um, So yeah, pushing to that 200 pounds and then holding that for a while, I think helped potentially. And this is talking about something that is just a 
hypothesis that potentially like we may, it's even uh, body fat settling points are somewhat of a hypothesis. They're not like a known thing, a body fat that the kind of body likes to be at. But if you hold a leaner physique for a while, it tends to just get easier and you kind of settle. And I think potentially there is something to being a bigger person holding that bigger body and the body's just like, okay, I'm going to hold on to this muscle now. And I'm going to kind of, this is okay. We're used to being a bit bigger. We let's, be this big um, rather than kind of, yeah, always being kind of in the same zone all the time. That's a ton of amazing insight and information on your, um, your whole thought process but behind that. I um, mean, and I can, I can say that the same thing from personal experience with, um, you know, definitely experiencing that fat phobia because of my background, you know, I struggle with an eating disorder for right. five years and, um, the, the initial thing that I had to, had to get over um, was just that fear of fat gain. And, um, you know, like you said, um, I, I think for a lot of, of listeners right now, something that will really resonate with them is what you said about, I'm already working so hard in the gym. Why would I make it any harder for myself to see a return on my investment? Because, you know, if you're really serious about, about this, you're probably, you know, if you're more intermediate to advanced, you're probably spending at least six hours a week in the gym to, to see these meaningful changes. So having, I, I really, really love that term that you and Mike um, have, have coined about a detectable surplus, because it is very, very true. It's like differences in like body water, your scales are not accurate either from day to day. There's a fluctuation, have that meaningful surplus so you can actually be like, okay, I am something is happening and like while you can just go go off of a mirror do like a body recomposition type of approach if you're beyond that noob stage you're probably not there's probably not much happening because you as you know we we all know if there in order for change to happen there has to be that stimulus for that change um so really really awesome things um i guess i kind of wanted to unpack a lot of what you, you kind of mentioned. You mentioned some things about nutrition, volume, uh, training twice a day. Um, I wanted to first, because I, this is kind of a hot topic r recently, um, Israel versus Helms, Madison Square oh, yeah. Gardens. <laughs> Should we increase volume across the mesocycle cycle or not? And I wanted to talk about um, your experience with because I know that you talk about, yeah, I looked up to Matt Ogus a lot and you, you still do. And like all the guys from 3D Muscle Journey, Alberto Nunez, Eric Helms, Jeff, Jeff Alberts. Um, and then, you know, response periodization, um, Jerry Feather, James Hoffman, Mike Isertel with their volume landmark approach. Um, I guess in what situations, because I don't think it's it's either or and i think that that's something that eric and mike have have basically kind of <laughs> been like you look guys like this is just two ways to skin a cat um but what situations would you decide with a client for example um and talk a little bit about your experience using both approaches when would using more of a static set volume across the measles cycle makes sense for an athlete or somebody or the volume land landmark. And if you could hypothesize, if you don't know that, that's fine. I know I would hypothesize off of my personal experience, um, which one is, is likely better for hypertrophy outcomes. Cool. So yeah, it's, it is a hot topic and they should be coming on the podcast uh, eventually to discuss it together. Uh, yeah. And actually, they were meant to be in the UK this year for a seminar and that obviously never went ahead. So they would have been um, chatting it face to face, which would have just been really, really cool. And yeah. This is the stuff I love where you get two of the brightest minds within two of the brightest minds within kind of the evidence based sphere about hypertrophy with slightly differing views on a topic. And then they can sit down and just be like, let's talk this out. Why do you think this? Why do I think this? And I, I mean, when you get people of that intellect at that level with differing views, you know, neither one of them 
can definitely be right, essentially, <laughs> or we can't know. Because if one of them, we just knew, if one person was arguing, oh, I think a calorie deficit is important. And the other one's like, no, it's just clean food. It's like, well, okay, you're not, you're obviously not <laughs> the person we like thought was like up here or this, the, the, the person talking the calorie deficit can essentially be- defeat or uh, win this person over within a scientific debate. Whereas for these guys, when, if they do come on the podcast and talk this out, I don't imagine they come to a solid conclusion of, oh yeah, Eric was right. Or Mike was right. Maybe down the line, this will happen. Who knows? But essentially both of them have, like you said, their methods, they both obviously work. Um, and it's just trying to identify and, and for the, the person training, it's, it's tricky because it's like, well, do I go static or do I add? And I think the right thing to do is try both and see which one you prefer and which one seems to drive more results because N equals one, like you are your own training study and you should experiment. So don't kind of be like, Oh, I have to work for my MEV, go to my MRV. If you've never tried static sets, maybe try it. Um, or if you're doing one or the other and it's working really, really well, you can expect anything better than maybe you just stick. So I don't think there is necessarily a right or wrong answer, but at least for myself, um, I never thought of sets as a tool you could really manipulate. I just was like, yeah, I do three sets or five sets or whatever it is in the program. I, I, I think uh, when I initially was building programs, it was more so built around powerlifting or strength programs because in reality, that's where all the textbooks came. So when you're coming into the industry and you're focused on hypertrophy, I mean, most of the textbooks were all a periodization for strength sports and stuff like that. So they weren't specific towards hypertrophy at all. So I think that confused people a lot initially and like sets were just not something that people manipulated. It was load intensity, um, things like that. So yeah, when I first was training, it just wasn't something I ever manipulated. And I did, I did, um, some programs I did was like five, three, one. I remember doing that for hypertrophy, which, um, probably isn't the best <laughs> now I look I back <laughs> <laughs> and then well August was doing five through one so I had to do five through one and then obviously came across Lar McDonald he had his generic bulking routine which I think is a solid routine um, and then ca- kind of came across the muscle and strength pyramids and they were more so using I think it was worm bombs uh, study back like that was always oh, one yeah, people yeah. Would reference where I can't even remember they were doing like sets uh, set volley uh, no sets multiplied by repetitions I think it was like you had to hit a certain number of repetitions per muscle group. I think it's like 70 reps or something. I can't even, I can't actually remember or recall what it was because looking back, that probably wasn't the best way yeah. to do things. And I mean, this is the view of science. Science just evolves over time and we get close to the truth, like I said. So now most people, when they're talking about sets, I mean, volume five poetry, they're kind of talking about hard sets. So anything close to failure, that's kind of a set towards hypertrophy. And now that's why when we're talking about how much volume do we need to grow? It's kind of like this many sets per muscle group rather than like volume load or because that just is all quite confusing. Even sets can get kind of confused because it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I only need to do 10 sets. So I'm just going to do 10 sets of leg extensions a week. It's like, well, that might not quite work. <laughs> um, so like for all these things, there's so many, so much nuance um, to chat about. But yeah, from my experience, I never manipulated sets um, and I got into a position and I would say this is something that maybe 3DMJ have changed their perspective on, but um, they were, I think, uh, and I wouldn't want to speak for them, but a little bit power building focused. So they would use kind of some heavy loading sets. Um, so like maybe some triples or something within a program and then have like hypertrophy work tagged on. So it was like, in a sense, like extreme daily undulating periodization where there'd be like strength work and then hypertrophy work and uh, I would say that was fairly non-specific overall towards hypertrophy. Not everything in the program was driven towards hypertrophy. So I was doing that. And I, that was at the time I also wasn't pushing my body weight up and I was kind of just struggling. I was kind of spinning my wheels. So I found the hypertrophy work would tire me for the strength and vice versa. The strength work would just tank me for any of the hypertrophy work. So it wasn't until I started like actually making everything in the program specific towards hypertrophy that things started actually more so improving especially as you get more advanced it's kind of i always use the analogy of at school when you start and you're an idiot you can learn every subject (laughs) as you get much more intelligent as you age you have to get more and more specific until you take something to like phd level and it's like this minute niche topic because there's just that you can't take in more in your brain than that 
And if you want to be that good at that, you need to be hyper specific. So I think as you get more advanced as a trainee, you have to get more and more specific towards your goal. So it was important for me to get more specific towards hypertrophy. So I definitely started moving everything into kind of five plus repetitions, not fatiguing myself with like powerlifting style training with no eccentrics and just like heavy loads and low bar and deadlifts and things like that. So that definitely helped. And I would say that was more of Mike's perspective because his main principle of kind of training was specificity. And that's when I read the scientific principles of strength training, which was just for me, an absolute game changer. It was the first kind of book yeah. that made sense. Like every book that I'd read up to that point, I was like, I kind of know half of this. It kind of half of this makes sense, but I don't know if I can build a program. Whereas this one's just like, okay, these are the principles. This is the priorities. This is how you might develop a program. And that's when I read about volume landmarks. And that's when I've read about set progression. I was like, admit, then I can remember in the book, they're like, people don't use sets. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> they're like, you can. Uh, and it's like, as the way I look at it, and the way I always really looked at it is like, why would you remove a tool? Like you've got load on the bar, you've got like uh, relative intensity, you've got like rep ranges. Why would you not manipulate sets just because it kind of confuses things or like what you need good a reason not to? Because for me, it was like another tool in the toolbox, like, oh, okay, so I can use this in addition to those other tools to get the best outcomes. So um, I was very convinced of, I mean, the, the funny thing with the volume landmarks is, is it's not like you can really say they don't exist. It's just like, well, like there is a minimum effective volume that just, there has to be. And then there has to be a maximal recoverable volume. And then in between that, I mean, I guess it makes sense. So that's your maximal adaptive volume. So I started incorporating that, I think early 2016, maybe, um, and working through like volume landmarks and I sucked at it. <laughs> I did way too much volume. I did um, what a lot of people unfortunately fall into the trap of is just doing, thinking more is better. Volume is dose response, has a dose response relationship with hypertrophy. So let's just do more. And I think I ended up my technique not being fully there, my relative intensity not being fully there. And these are things where they're super foundational. And I think you need to have those things in check, like technique and kind of your intensity in check before you start ramping volume up. Uh, when I start clients now um, working with me, I'm like, I need in that first week, your form videos. We're in really low volume. We're far away from failure. I want to see actually what that looks like for you because if it doesn't look right, I don't want to give you more of this like medicine essentially that's not good medicine for you because you're not taking the right medicine. So I need to make sure it's the right medicine. Your technique is good. Your intent is there. And then based off your feedback, based off your recovery, maybe a little bit more will improve things. And when I think about the dose response to hypertrophy, like more volume does lead to more hypertrophy so long as you can recover from it. That tends to be true, at least from what I've seen. I know Eric kind of argues like your ability to do more sets is just like an ability, like more fitness. It's not necessarily a hypertrophic adaptation. Uh, and I, I just don't see the, the risks or the cost to it. It's kind of like maybe more, pro you don't need this much protein. Maybe you could get away with less, but why do you want to get away with less if potentially more could give you more? And there's no risks involved with having a bit more protein. And I see, I see it the same with sets. If you're being careful with your autoregulation, you're basing it off the fact like my pumps are still really good. I'm getting good disruption in the muscle. I'm not just going through the motions. I am training with intent. It just feels so right. I am recovering between sessions. I'm not going to sessions super beat up. I think if you're ticking off all those boxes, the risk of doing more sets is just more time. Obviously, every set is a potential risk of injury, but I think as you are already got your foundation of technique, intensity, you're not doing anything silly, and the risk of injury is always going to be there. So there's definitely an upside of, well, there is a dose response to hypertrophy. It probably, this could be providing an extra stimulus towards growth. Why would I not add a set there? Um, especially if I wasn't getting good pumps, I wasn't getting disruption, I was way recovered, and I was just like, yeah, this kind of feels like I'm working out, but not really. So if you're feeling like that, then yeah, more is probably going to help you go forward. And uh, I've cycled through volume landmarks for myself and with many clients for like years now. And it just, if you auto-regulate it correctly um, and you are careful and honest, it can work really well. Um, the times it doesn't work well is when you don't have those foundations in place and you are of the mindset, more is better. And I have some clients who are of that mindset and I have to just be like, 
no, 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 we don't need to do any more. You've already, you just told me this week smashed you. I know you want to do more, but let's just keep things where they are. So I think that auto-regulation is super important. I think Mike and Eric are both really on board with that auto-regulation element needing to be there, where it is a case of um, like do dosing it out very, very carefully rather than just being like, oh yeah, so I'm going to work from eight to 30 sets because I should be able to do that. And they just add them willy nilly. Like you're listening to feedback, you're listening to your recovery, you're listening to like those bio feedback from the pump and disruption from the muscles. And yeah, you're taking it carefully through. So yeah, um, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong at the moment. I think the main problem I would have is if someone wanted to start, they're like, I want to start my maximal adaptive volume and just stay there. And it's just like, yeah. well, it's just a, un a poor understanding of the volume and marks at that point, because you can't stay at a maximal adaptive volume because that moves. So you need to actually move your sets up because you adapt to it. Uh, and so I also don't like that approach because you essentially are introducing a big stress immediately. It's like people who train to failure week one of their mesocycle after a deload. It's like, well, what are you going to do next week? Train more to failure? Like, haven't you already gone yeah. to failure? And like, you're just, harder than last time. <laughs> you're busting a nut, like in that first week. It's <laughs> like, we have clear evidence now. You do not need to go that far to failure. And you can just slowly build up. And this actually comes back to one of the things you were saying of like the short term, short termism versus long term. I think short term bodybuilders just like harder now, like. Um, and that's something I've learned to be better at is like holding myself back a little bit in that early start of my mesocycle because I always struggled with that because out of a deload feeling so fresh and so great. That's definitely one of the things I've improved upon is like, okay, let's, let's not do another set here. Like you've already got a great response from like two or three sets. You don't, don't grind out any reps in week one. It's not a good place to be. So getting that foundation in place first is, yeah, it's been a game changer for me. Yeah, I am. Um... You know, I, I come from a background of um, more of a sports medicine type of a background. So I, I've worked with, with, with athletes as an athletic trainer. Um, and I can definitely, like, and I, I know that, that RP kind of comes from that whole mindset of, because James and Mike are sports scientists. Um, and with competitive seasons, they do apply those, those principles, MEV, MAV, MRV. And I, I do think it makes good good sense as long as you understand how to how to do it. Um, like you said, listen to your biofeedback. Um, why not do more as long as you're staying within the constraints of what your body can adapt to? And you you'll learn over time what 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 it does, what it can tolerate rather. Um, I uh, really love what you said though about how technique needs to be there. Because this is what I posted this in my in my uh, in my group is because you know I have a lot more newer lifters and um, in my in my demographic, and I kind of said like, look guys, maybe this isn't as much volume as you're used to, but I really want you to focus on getting really really awesome technique and really dialing in in things, and I think that um, Steve, this is something that you know you've definitely harped on a lot more and i it's something that i've gotten a lot more more into is just emphasizing really really good technique with with training because you can do a ton of sets and that may kind of makes up for it but especially myself i like i'm a you know power lifter i have to have my technique absolutely dialed in and i think that with bodybuilding because it's less about technique or i just feel the row i just feel it and i got a good pump cool like kind of like like but we do need to make sure that there are fundamental things in place before we do start to add to add volume so i can see the, the benefit to uh to, to both approaches um i i really think it comes down to lots of you know and, and this is why i you know i'm sure that you and i both love exercise science and stuff like this is it's so case dependent. Mm -hmm. There's not one clear answer that we have at the, at the time. Like it's a brand new field. And, you know, I, I have understood that, you know, Mike has gotten criticized for his theories, et cetera, but like their theories based off of good science and good understanding of fundamental uh, human physiology. 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like that's, it's, it's not either or, I, I guess, because I, I, well, I do also um, think that talking to Jared and whatnot, they've kind of said, you don't have to add sets every single week. Like if you can, if you feel like you could potentially get like another good week at one volume, and you can, that's still, you know, adaptive to you. Like if you got really, really super, super sore and really, really messed up from that, but you could still feel like you could probably do more next week in terms of like a load or at a, at a, you know, a rep, you know, that's also a possibility. Yeah. It's one of the, actually you kind of asked me, how would I apply it to clients? And there are individual differences there for sure. And they will do center a little bit around the volume landmarks because I feel like they always have to. It's kind of like, uh, where is your minimum effective volume? Where is your MRV? And these are set numbers, but you can progress even if they're very close, your MEV to MRV. Maybe you're an advanced bodybuilder in your kind of dieting phase. So your MEV is a little bit elevated because you're in a calorie deficit. So you need that little bit of a bump in muscle protein synthesis through your training stimulus. But because you're in a deficit, now your recovery is really hampered so your mrv maybe there's only like a set there and you just add it somewhere through a four week accumulation of a kind of four weeks of training and so the rest of the time like you said you're just accumulating volume through um, and when we have like this is where volume has different definitions you're accumulating volume through repetitions or load um, and those sort of things whereas yeah for a, a newbie like they might have a really low mev really high mrv but first I need to make sure that their form and technique is there. So I might keep them at their MEV for a while and then they just accumulate for like, I don't know, 10 weeks or something because the first few weeks are technique ingraining, getting their relative intensity in a good place. And I, I don't work with like full stop newbies because I feel like they need to go into the gym and learn technique with a, a real kind of in-person PT. But like early intermediates, they for sure, they might have the technique basics down, but like they kind of know how to squat but if they do this with their feet and they kind of angle them out this way and they sit down deeper, lower the load. Now it's like, okay, now you're getting a full squat. That's what we want it to look like. And that might take a few weeks and then you just progress sets up. So that's where you can still use the volume landmarks, but one guy's program where he added one set over the course of four weeks looks completely different to this kind of early intermediate in their off season. Who's added like maybe 10 sets over the course of like 10 weeks because they've just been learning to form and technique and everything. And I think that's, unfortunately people want that black and white answer. They want the easy things like, okay, so yeah, I started 10 sets. I end at 20 sets. That's what I do. Like for every muscle group, it's like, oh no, you have to apply the volume landmark to the individual, but also every individual muscle group and it might change. So you need to auto-regulate it and take biofeedback. And that's why I coach people because people don't know necessarily how to do that for themselves from the get go, or they can't trust themselves to do that. Mm. Yeah, really, really. I, I agree with, with, with all that entirely. Um, and that, that is really the value of, of, of a coach, um, you know, because they are that eye in the sky to make sure that you are doing things, things right and keep you on, on track because especially with, with bodybuilding, it's so easy to have that emotional attachment to, to something, you know, and with, with power lifters, it's like, Oh, I got to add 10 pounds to my bench press this month. But like, as if you can become more and more logical and methodical with your training and really trust the process and trust that you have a really, really good, good plan um, in place, you'll probably make the best progress. And that's why I, I really think that understanding the science behind how do we best see muscle growth um, and what goes all into that, you, you kind of have this, this certainty of where you're headed. It, like you are going in this direction and you, and you know for absolute certain. And how many people can actually say that in the gym? I know this result is going to happen from this. And that's why I, I, I really think that it's so important to understand exercise science and, you know, have evidence-based fitness really just as the, as the guide and as the compass. Um, and I'm sure that's something that, that you can relate to because I know that for myself, like initially when you're a new lifter, it's like I, I walked into the gym, I touched the weight and I gained five pounds of muscle. But as you go further along, paying attention to these minor 
details, um, being more in tune with your tech technique, making sure that you're getting a proper stimulus without needlessly fatiguing your, yourself. So then you can have a longer, better accumulation phase, um, scientific dieting, um, which is actually what I wanted to, to talk about, about next. Um, and then also having adequate recovery. So I guess uh, the full framework for the rest of the podcast will be like kind of all, all of that. Um, what is, so in terms of nutrition for um, a bodybuilder. Sorry, you, you, I lost you for a second. <laughs> oh. In terms of nutrition for a bodybuilder, um, how would you structure a year-long macro cycle or uh, deter, or like, yeah, I guess for a, a client in terms of nutritional periodization, um, in terms of when is it appropriate to cut? How would you go about that? Um, maintenance periods, which are often very overlooked. Um, I know Eric Helm has just said that bodybuilders are great at, mani- at manipulating body composition, not so great at maintaining it because most of them don't practice it. Um, and then massing. We already kind of talked about, about that, yeah. but we should briefly go over that. But Shall I take... So I kind of take me um, as an example from my contest prep. Say someone's just come out of contest prep. What, how would I yeah. kind of take them from that point? Yeah, I, cool. I think that, that's a good starting point. Cool, yeah, I'll take them from like recovering from contest prep into their off season and then an off season and then where they might then again think about starting a new contest prep, for example. Yeah, perfect. Cool, so yeah, from after a contest prep, assuming we're talking about a male bodybuilder who is down at like 5% body fat, like essential stores, and they've got legit stayed shredded and they've dieted over the course of maybe 20 weeks to get there. And maybe they've had some diet breaks. They've kind of had some, potentially some refeeds. They've obviously had peak weeks where they've had more carbs, but essentially they're in a state where they are um, not in a state that they're with good well-being, they've got low levels of testosterone their cortisol levels are going to be really high their leptin levels are going to be really low the hunger is going to be way out of control they're going to be hangry as fuck and they're not in a good position and this is just not maintainable so we need to get body fat on them actually we need we in this stage this is the one time where you're actually targeting you're like i do want body fat because that's going to bring back a lot of the hormones uh, because you're going to bring the, the body fat back on and also having that more energy availability by being in a big surplus. So um, I really like 3DMJ's recovery diet where they put you into a meaningful surplus, essentially as a bit more meaningful than what I would normally go for in a, a kind of improvement season phase. And this is gaining like up to a percentage of body weight, like on a week basis. And you might be up 10% over stage weight. Uh, so for a lot of people, that's going to be like 15 pounds or so um 15 to 20 pounds within like 10 weeks it's a pretty brief period where you're just gaining lots back um and it's going to look different for everyone um for me i am a leaner individual i was holding like barely anything above stage weight and feeling relatively okay whereas some people they just feel like trash essentially what we're trying to do is bring someone Um, I think of like body fat settling points we brought up before where it's like this settling point where you feel good. And I think there's a bit of a range for a lot of guys. It might be 10 to 15% where they feel their best. Anything above that or below that, they're a bit like, this is a bit uncomfortable. So 5%, you're way below that. So you need like maybe 5% up. But for some guys, they might need to get up like into the, the higher teens to feel better, depending on where they've come from. So over the course of like five to 10 weeks, you might get up to like 10% body fat get back into that healthy range of body fat where the body feels good with that i i suppose i don't need to talk about training so i'll just keep it to the the diet side so but whenever i'm in a surplus i'm putting hypertrophy training in place because they go together synergistically once i'm back in a good place because we've been dieting for ages and then we've just put on a load of calories into a surplus both being in a surplus and in a dieting state when you're trained changing body composition and trying to change homeostasis it's a stress being in a surplus is a stress, being in a deficit is a stress. So you've been stressed for ages. Your training has been God knows high volume for ages because you've been dieting, trying to maintain as much muscle as possible. And then you've just been trying to build it. So I like to maintain then just like cool off. Essentially, you've just been like putting down full throttle for a period of time. Let's just cool off the engine. So that would be like a primer phase or a maintenance period where training is nice, low volume, maintenance intake. I also like that well not that first one because still you're probably a little bit diet fatigued and you can't start like loosening up tracking too much you probably still need to have 
some tracking in place but that transition period again it, it's going to look different for everyone but i do like to remove some of the kind of restraints and constraints of tracking from prep where maybe you out of five you have a five out of five tracking i track and weigh every little thing but now you like you don't track your chewing gum you're not tracking leafy greens you don't track your apple and banana you just kind of know what weight they weigh um, and then during that maintenance period, maybe you kind of get a bit away from more of those tracking elements. You're just like, okay, I'm just going to track protein and calories during this period of time. I'm not too worried about carbs and fat because I'm maintaining anyway. So it's not a huge deal. As long as I hit my protein, hit my calories at the end of the day, I'm golden. So after that, I then like to, they're in their improvement season because they're in a really good place. They're now hormonally in a pretty healthy place. They might not be fully recovered, but they're feeling they kind of the majority of the recovery is done. So now they can actually like really gain muscle with their training let's put ourselves into a meaningful surplus i like most people to be gaining at one uh, one to two percent every month or every mesocycle. cycle i think that's a good rate for most people males and females i think that's pretty decent um, and then i would move through three to five meso, uh, three to four sorry mesocycles cycles generally um, it may even be five depending on how things are going how good they are at kind of staying on the leaner side if they actually did get back to 10% and then they've kind of kept to the lower end of the gaining rate. Maybe we go for five at absolute max. That's probably as far as I take it. You probably move up and move up and at the same time you're accumulating body fat um, and you probably want to throw in a mini cut to help again, appetite regulation. It's going to be a lot lower volume phase slightly again. So it's going to help with training potentiation, like reset training volumes uh, and also bring down body fat, which probably helps partitioning ratios um, there is a little bit of controversy around that subject. I can't say that I know. I can say anecdotally, when I've been leaner, things tend to just feel like they, they're going in better and I don't feel as lethargic and clients tend to be the same. Uh, just the response to nutrition seems to be better and partitioning ratios are essentially when you eat, where's that going? Is it going to muscle or fat? And that's somewhat regulated by insulin sensitivity. The leaner you are, tend to be a bit more insulin sensitive. So you just store things slightly better than when you're a bit it's also easier psychologically. So you did, who, was, who did you have on? Uh, it was the last Revive Stronger podcast. Uh, with, ben House. Ben, yeah, ben, ben, ben was saying that it might just be because like you can see the changes. Yeah. Easier. And so you're more like, okay, this is more fun. Absolutely. It's, I mean, psychology and physiology, especially as a coach, you know, they're intertwined completely. Like if, if your psychology is whack, the physiology is whack. Um, they just have to like, it's, I think the saying is body follows mind. Or I think that's essentially normally what the saying is, or at least it works in this scenario. So yeah, in that mass phase and when I'm in a mass phase, I tend to, again, it's going to be individual dependent. That's the rate of gain I like. For some people, I might not even gain that fast. It might be the individual who, I don't know, they uh, put their legs on MV because they are doing football or a sport alongside. And so we're just training upper body MEV to MRV. So they're just not gaining as much total body muscle. So that's why maybe the surplus is a bit smaller because they just don't have the capacity to train the legs uh, full, full throttle when they're doing the sport. Or if someone is just like, they're not as committed and they can only train like four days a week or three days a week and they're quite advanced. And I'm like, uh, you probably aren't getting quite enough volume. Maybe we actually, we even need to specialize again. We need to put something on maintenance, put something else on the front front foot. And so I still want to know we're in a surplus that's trackable. I wouldn't want to gain so slowly, but it might be a little bit modified for that reason. So actually, that, that's actually, is, um, you brought up something that I want to ask you about. You said if you have time constraints, you may want to just consider specializing in different muscle groups. So trying to train the full body. Yeah. Um, what made you come to that? conclusion so it's interesting because i find i've got clients who when they get to the point of which they're basically at training to failure but they aren't systemically overreached they've still got more in the tank but they haven't got any more time <laughs> they actually can't do anymore so they're training everything up close to mrv but they're not training anything to it um, and they're maybe not even covering their whole mav and so they might be better off prioritizing a couple of muscle groups keeping some on the back burner and then kind of rotating them at other time points. Um, like essentially it's just, they haven't got enough time to take all of their muscle groups from MEV to MRV. And I think probably there's a number of people that, cause they work office jobs, maybe very demanding jobs. They can only get in three, four times a week. 
train for an hour at a time, their MRVs are probably quite high in reality, but they just can't get there because they just haven't got the number of sessions or the time to be able to do it. So maybe that's where they prioritize muscle groups. They certainly don't have to, um, they, but if they wanted to, they could choose to maximize growth in some areas rather than getting a bit of growth everywhere. I really um, like that. Actually, yeah, yeah. So if, I think, yeah, for some gen pop people who are just like, I just want massive arms. can be like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's something I've never, ever considered. I've always just kind of thought, oh, well, you're just kind of just going to get suboptimal gains everywhere. You're, you, what you're basically saying is, no, like, let's, Matt, we, we can probably maximize a few muscle groups, but then everything else, probably MEV is what you're going to get. I, yeah. I really, really like that. Anyway, sorry for, uh, I just wanted no, sorry. to, that's, that's something I've never really heard of or considered, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a consideration, I think, only when you get into the practically applying it with a lot of people yeah. that you end up getting into the same position. You're just like, oh okay <laughs> this has happened I, mean, um, I guess like there's been some times with, with, with clients so i've been like uh so you're only training three days a week uh, what do you want do, like what do you want most so i, I guess that yeah, yeah you've done it yeah you've kind yeah. of noticed it but you haven't thought it through as a never, volume never volume. And i never thought of it like that but that makes good that makes really really good sense and sometimes because they're training like a lot less they recover because they've got so many days to recover. So their mesocycle length tends to be able to be longer. They recover and adapt quicker. So they might hit a two RAR week for a couple of weeks in a row because they've adapted and improved so much between those that now what was 10 by 100, wait, yeah, 10 by 100, like two RAR is now 10 by 105, yeah, 10 by 105, two RAR because they've adapted in that week because they had so much recovery time. They've kind of like their stress response adaptation curve, they've adapted plenty so though sometimes that can happen as well where their mesocycle lengths are just where you might have most clients who are like pushing the bounds with everything it's like oh you can only survive four or five weeks whereas yeah. these guys because they have so much yeah, days off they can get like six seven weeks out sometimes before they need to deload awesome so yeah the i think i was going to talk about um massing just the yeah. change in macronutrients that i tend to go for most people again this depends on a lot of people just have the preference of they just want to like monitor protein a little bit and look at calories and just see body weight go up. And they're just kind of mindfully eating. Maybe that's kind of a one extreme. Um, I don't have anyone intuitive eating because you can't actually intuitively eat and be in a surplus or cut because this kind of uh, the definition of intuitive eating is maintenance. Um, yeah. I might do intuitive eating in maintenance phases in off seasons, potentially, uh, especially for people who maybe really crave that element of not tracking and just kind of switching off. I think that's the best time to do it if you're going to ever do it, not after a cutting phase or something, because you're just going to gain all the fat back and intuitively eat your way back to where you were. <laughs> I even think intuitive eating in a mass context, like massing, maintaining, intuitive eating in that maintenance, I can, I'm concerned people would undereat because they're so fed up of eating loads of food, they just naturally fall into a deficit. And I just, I don't know if intuitive eating has a role within someone when they're trying to change their body composition at any extent, even if you're maintaining it at some stage. I'm pretty sure that Gabrielle Fendaro and like Eric Helms, like I remember there's something in mass where Eric was basically like, it's just, it's just not body composition oriented. And yeah. I, I know that you got a round table too. Yeah. So it's about that. So, yeah. It's, it's tricky. Cause I think it's just one of those things. It's part of the the cost of doing the sport is having a little bit of, like you need to take more control of your nutrition. Maybe you have a slightly less healthy relationship with food during that time. But a lot of the things that we do are very helpful in terms of we prioritize fruits and veggies, all that stuff. So yeah, anyway, that's kind of out of the context of this chat. Um, so yeah, during the mass phase, I tend to have a prioritization of carbohydrates. So essentially I'm like, okay, so from a physiology, like, yeah, your physiology only needs a certain amount of fat. Once we've hit that fat intake, the essential fat intake, um, to, for enough the good hormones, fats, uh, fat soluble vitamins and minerals, you get your essential fatty acids. You've hit that. You have enough protein for muscle protein synthesis and to be able to optimize that. Um, more is not better of these things uh, unless they just get you more calories. But why not have more carbs? Carbs are what fuel our training. They fuel the recovery. They also are most like insulinogenic so insulin is going to be higher from more carbs which could be well insulin is anti-catabolic 
So it should be hopefully kind of anabolic in that sense because it's anti-catabolic. Is that one of the right people to prioritize carbs? Sorry, I, you just posted something on, on Instagram about post-exercise protein breakdown. Um, okay. I, I, you basically said nutrient timing matters. Um, what do you, because I know that protein is insulin orgenic. Uh, is that one of the, one of the reasons why um, it, they've hypothesized, they've, found that and yeah it was it was an interesting study and i mean at best one studies like yeah. one study is interesting um they're never going to be game changing um that's when you look at meta-analyses and you look at research reviews uh, and like the, the kind of literature as a whole so it was interesting they had like eight guys who either ate an hour and a half before training or ate immediately post training or didn't eat at all and the guys who ate immediately post-training rather than pre, they didn't eat anything in the morning. They just ate after. They had the lowest muscle protein breakdown, which again, you could associate meaning they had the highest muscle protein synthesis. You'd kind of guess that if their muscle protein breakdown is the lowest. Um, they kind of said, well, what if we had the pre-workout immediately before training? Would that have led to the same result as having it after training? And I think probably it would have helped. But the issue with that is if you're eating a whole food meal, you can't train with that in your stomach. So it has some practical limitations. And it, the study is, again, like I said, at best interesting because practically, what are we doing anyway? We're eating breakfast and then we're eating post-workout and then we're eating later again because we eat every three to five hours because yeah. the literature as a whole kind of supports having regular protein feedings through the day um, uh, and relatively evenly spread out through the day. That tends to be where the literature is siding um there is some interesting thoughts on how important all of that is and whether or not you do need to spread it out that much but i think at the moment it's kind of one of those of what's the cost of doing so you're going to eat every three to five hours anyway or so make sure you just spread your protein through that sorry just really 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 fast um i know you did have greg potter on the podcast too um and he's really big into chrono new yeah. i know that you've recently started have you've recently started implementing that a little bit more in uh, your own lifestyle, right? Because I, I know that myself too, um, I've have kind of fallen into the whole trap of, Oh, it's just easier for me to backload all my calories. Um, have you found that your results and like your, you know, like your, your energy and body composition have improved from chrono nutrition kind of, and for those who are unfamiliar, it's basically just eating more in the earlier periods of, of the day to fuel that activity and more around your, your, your workouts um and less in the in the biological evening if i'm is that a pretty adequate so, so. yeah it's chrono nutrition's really interesting and i like i love greg and i think he's amazing and i think he explains that stuff really well so i would recommend if people want to get a, a full insight into what that means they should check that out but it's kind of part of your circadian rhythm which is like the, the what the body likes to do day to day um at particular times and it seems like food or nutrition and light have a real big impact on your circadian rhythm and so when you eat can impact kind of how you feel day to day and um yeah some of the things uh, it was funny thinking about it like um like some of the old school bro things of like have a breakfast of a king a lunch of a prince and then like a dinner of a pauper like that actually seems to actually line quite well with the chrono nutrition research um, that research, it hasn't been done on like bodybuilders. So it, it's fairly non-specific. It's kind of gen pop. Um, but there is that general rule of you're a bit more insulin sensitive. So that kind of partitioning ratio tends to be better in the morning. It tends to lead to people being a bit more energetic during the day. They uh, have higher levels of meat or NEPA, uh, which allows them to burn more calories. Whereas having it in the evening, again, it's like more likely to be stored as fat because insulin sensitivity is a bit lower and you don't get that energetic benefit in the day. But yeah, something, and a big part of that also is uh, having a large bolus of food in the evening impairs sleep for most people, um, particularly when you're consuming a lot of food. So yeah, on a cut, people have said it like, oh, because going to bed hungry can impair your sleep as well. And I think on a cut, it all matters a bit less because you're in a deficit, your insulin sensitivity is probably a bit better anyway. Um, and kind of you're never eating a ton of food because you're dieting. Um, but for someone gaining and for me, I had kind of taken habits from cutting of where I would save some food for the evening and I'd kind of eat like a cut during the day and then I'd just have like, oh, okay, I've got like 1,500 calories to eat in the last two hours before bed. 
uh, you're going to be sweating in bed. Your, <laughs> your stomach's going to be upset. It's just not going to lead to the best outcomes there. So yeah, for about the last probably four months, I've been making sure to have a big breakfast and prioritize eating more in the day and less as and less in the evening, essentially. And the main thing I, I can't necessarily, it's really hard to identify whether or not it had really positive effects on my body composition because there's so many things involved. Um, like it's just, I just finished a cut. I was fairly insulin yeah. sensitive anyway. I was nice and lean. Um, I was really happy how everything went over the last like three months. Um, I think my composition, like bodies look really great from everything I've been doing despite Corona hasn't held me back too much. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it, again, I think it's helped my sleep. Um, but it's hard to I, necessarily identify it. The main thing I definitely noticed, but it's funny saying it now because today has been a bit of an off day, but I had noticed my appetite had been higher. Like I just found I was hungrier through the day, which uh, for massing is good. Like it's great being hungry on a mass because you need to be to eat the food. Um, that was the main thing I found. Uh, and I don't like stuffing myself before bed now. It's quite nice having an empty stomach going to bed. Um, so that has been a benefit, but yeah, I, I can't honestly say I've noticed anything like major from it. Um, but it's hot again, it's hard because there's so many variables going on to be able to identify it. Yeah. I, I just, I just, that was just something that I was, you know, I had selfishly been, been wondering because it's a, it's a new area of kind of new, nutritional research, I yeah. guess. Right. It's a lot of people and me included when i thought of nutrient timing i didn't think outside of oh carbs around training protein spread through the day and like maybe not too much fat and fiber around your workouts but then it's like oh actually it makes sense that there may be some like other things to think about uh, with nutrient timing that are outside of training related aspects but um, even again the training puts a spanner in the works because once you train now you're very insulin sensitive so what like are you now now you need to bias carbs here as well so if you train in the evening how do you balance that with sleep and those are some of the things we talk about in in the podcast yeah so if you guys do want to know more about that um steve has a ton of episodes on about that uh well a, a few on his uh on his channel um but um we're, we're coming up on an hour i just wanted to really quickly just ask about um I guess, recovery strategies for, for bodybuilding. Um, and I guess, um, if we talk about D D lows determining how many rest days you should be taking per week on um, what a rest day should look like, stuff like, stuff like, like, like that, because, um, coming from an athletic training background, you know, I can kind of, and you know, James Hoffman can also, you know, say this relaxation is probably like the biggest thing. Um, and like a lot of these modalities are just like going to have like a nocebo effect slash like placebo is just making you feel better and what and whatnot. But uh, what have you found to be best in terms of recovery for body builder with rest days? How do you de deload? Um, yeah, let's just go from there. Cool. So yeah, essentially when a client signs up with me, they put in how many days they can train. So if they can train four days, it's four days. If they can train six, it's six days. Um, and if they're saying I can train like as many days as I need to, uh, which is great because then I can like pick and choose. And essentially that comes down to how much volume do they need to do? Um, how, uh, if they need to do more, probably need to do more days to dis distribute it over more days. So it's higher quality. Um, you don't want to have to do like three full body sessions as an advanced trainee if you can do six and spread it out through like a somewhat of a like push pull legs like on a bird's eye view type of split um so that's essentially where then the rest days are i always want at least one rest day um i think i think people probably could train seven days a week and they could get away with that my concern is like we talked about the psychology i'm not sure it's so healthy going to the gym every day <laughs> i don't know um there's just something about it that just seems a bit like for me, at least that day off is an opportunity. Like I, I train six days a week and some of them are twice daily um, or, or split into two. So I train twice. So if that rest day for me is like, oh, like it's such a relief not having to go to the gym. I get to like hang out with friends and not worry about kind of having to like plan things around. So that one rest day is really great. And I think also just from a muscle like physiology perspective, maybe having that one rest day and particularly like a back-to-back -back rest day on the weekend 
could just be so recovery, um, like just so helpful for recovery. But yeah, so that's essentially how I decide rest days. Um, like it's how many days a week you train and then spreading out volume across the number of days and then however many days resting, they're resting those days. Uh, and then, yeah, on rest days, I mean, I, for me personally, again, I just like to do stuff away from the gym and just like, I, I tend to go for walks with friends or like getting out and about with the dog and listen to podcasts or do chores around the house, whatever I need to do. Um, I'm not thinking about the gym essentially. Uh, and I don't do any kind of, I don't know, some people like to go for like massages or they go and use a Theragun or something or like foam rolling and stretching and yoga. And like, I, like you mentioned, like I have nothing against any of those, but I'm not thinking they're going to be a game changer. I'm not thinking they're going to be like particularly efficacious. I think going for a relaxing walk is probably going to get a lot of the same benefits because it's just the relaxation element. It's the switching off from the gym and everything. So that's what I tend to do. And for clients the same, I'm just like, just use that rest day as a day to chill out and um, like, don't worry about because I think it's like we always some athletes feel like they always have to be doing something and rest days are I need to do something and so they're like focused on and then in those for people like that it's like okay you can do foam rolling you can do stretching you can do these sort of activities that are going to hopefully propel recovery and they're certainly not going to harm it in any way shape or form so that's how I tend to do those and then deloads um, I like taking a deload week some people like having just kind of a week off the gym I find when you do that and especially I've seen it anecdotally a lot with people when they just take a week off they feel great they're very recovered but when they come in everything feels fucking heavy <laughs> and their performance is down and I think that's related to the fact that they haven't maintained fitness which is essentially what the deload is doing for us in combination with helping re reduce fatigue we're also maintaining that fitness level so we haven't not squatted for a week. So when we come into squat, the body's like, I still know how to squat exactly how we were before. And so you feel good coming in and it's just much a smoother transition um, to the next mesocycle. So when people do deload, I really ramp down volume. So that's pretty much a like maintenance level, volume levels. It's like near week one set numbers or lower than that. Um, the intensity, so weight on the bar is, for the first half of the week, I tend to keep it a bit heavier. Um, maybe near week one numbers. And then the second half is like stripped in half. So super easy towards the end of the week. And they tend to perform just half repetitions of what they've been doing. So reps in reserve are like not even a question. It's like really? five plus repetitions mm -hmm. in reserve. It's super easy. You're just getting blood flow really um, and keeping movement patterns. I would say this to people like when they try and like, oh, can I do metabolite work in my deload? Or can I do BFR? Because like that's not too damaging or whatever. And I'm just like the goal of the deload is to maintain fitness and remove fatigue. You can't do anything overloading or fatigue inducing. So you just basically want to go in there, go through the motions, get a bit of blood flow and get out. Uh, and if you can't do that, don't go to the gym because you don't want to end up inducing a stress because that's not going to lead to good mesocycle coming out. You need to refuel uh, and recover for that whole week. So sometimes uh, for some people I recommend, or I, I always give them as an option, because some of the sessions can end up being really short just say like you can combine some of these deload sessions if you're like doing a push pull legs push pull legs combine your push and pulls train four days a week and then take the last like three days off so you can come in you kind of get that combined effect of enjoying not going to the gym as much but also you get the the fitness maintenance through going to the the gym and also it has been shown by doing some light training you expedite recovery even more so by not going to the gym you really are not getting the best outcomes i don't think but it can be done and people do do it. And I think those are the people who can't go to the gym and just train light. They need to go in there and go balls to the wall. So it's like, okay, you stay away <laughs> because we don't want you in there. You need to focus on something else for that week. So yeah, rest days and deloads are some of the biggest ones. And then the maintenance periods come in and they're kind of like the deload to the macro cycle in a sense where maybe you take a low volume maintenance period for every six months of training where it's just like, okay, lower down to maintenance volume, lower the, uh, raise the absolute intensities um, and just go through the motions for those three weeks and then come out and essentially resensitize a lot of these kind of fatigue adaptations that have taken place. Great. Um, and then last thing about the deloads, um, with nutrition, a lot of times um, a concern is, well, I'm doing less volume. So how should I change my nutrition and i know that Revive stronger has published a great article on this 
um, what do you, you know, and it should be at maintenance, but a lot of times people are like, well, I don't know if my maintenance is the same if I'm lowering down sets. How do you navigate that? Yeah, that article, I remember writing that article. I don't know how old it is now, so I don't know if I'm going to contradict it. Maybe slightly, I'm not sure. Um, but Pascal actually has done a new presentation uh, that I think he said he was very proud of. So I'm, I'm assuming it's very good um, over on the members site on like everything deloads. People are wanting to see that. But yeah, for me, um, during a mass phase, I like to continue the calorie surplus for the first maybe three days. Um, it depends. Some people I continue it throughout if maybe they haven't gained in that last week. And then it's like, well, is it maintenance or is it a surplus? But I'll try not to confuse it because like I'm, I'm, there's so many individual kind of dependent, depends on what the, the context is. But most of the time for a mass phase, I continue the mass calories for maybe three days of the deload. And then the last four days I go to maintenance. Um, and that's just predictive maintenance based off how fast they've been gaining. So if they've been gaining a pound a week, we can roughly guess they're going to be in a 500, sur uh, 500 calorie surplus every day based off 3,500 calories and like a, a gram of tissue on the body. So yeah, I might go from like, if they gained a pound on the week, they're 3,500 calories. They take down to 3,000 for the last four days. Uh, and that's just to maintain because... I like to keep the surplus going a little bit just because I tend to overreach most of my clients. So they train really hard. Um, and then I kind of need them to have the extra calories for extra recovery. And also maybe we're getting some adaptations at the start of the deload week from having kind of pushed the bounds so far in that kind of hypertrophy block. And then towards the end, it's like, well, if we're in a surplus, yeah, we might get even better recovery, but we probably have got all the recovery we need uh, and we might end up gaining unnecessary fat in that last kind of few days and again like you said training changes so maybe your maintenance is a bit less but i just i'm like we don't need to worry about those minute like details and, yeah let's not stress out about that too much if we're in a slight like surplus those last days it's not a big deal most people are just so wiped out during that deload week they're like oh, i need they kind of need, feel like they need the food anyway um, especially in a mass phase where you can really overreach people whereas in a cutting phase um, tend to not overreach people as much. I don't think the benefits are as as obvious because recovery is just so much harder in a cut and you're probably not able to you know, kind of gain as much muscle. So I, I don't tend to push people as hard into a deload week. So then during that deload week, depending on where they are, for some people, I mean, as a default answer, I like bringing everyone up to maintenance for that week because you get the refuel, the psychological refuel. You also get to refuel glycogen. And then you can take that into the next mesocycle and then it can act to kind of propel the next mesocycle. Um, for people who have deadlines or who are like, I don't need a whole week at maintenance, I might then, I could diet them through it all. I tend not to do that very often. And part of the reason for that is, is particularly I like to deload people very lightly towards the end of the deload week so that they're really ready to train hard coming out. And because like I talked about before, your minimum effective volume is higher when you're in a deficit. So you need more training to support things uh, because you haven't got the kind of the calories coming in the everything there so towards that end of the deload week if you're dieting and you're training really easy it's like well what's supporting muscle protein synthesis there's nothing so i like to have the training there to just ensure we don't risk any muscle loss at all um, so towards the end of the deload week i might always have like three or two days at least where we're at maintenance calories just to secure all muscle um, because yeah muscle gain is so hard. Like we already spoke about, I don't like risking any of it. And again, that can refuel people going into the next mesocycle. Uh, and I, I think that approach works really well. And I think it has like uh, a good rationale behind it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Um, I really, really appreciate you being willing to, to come on and kind of just share your, your thoughts and your, your insights and everything that you have learned, um, over the, uh, over your bodybuilding career. Um, so if you guys want to, uh, learn more about Revive Stronger and Steve, where should they find you? Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I always appreciate being interviewed and being able to just blabble for a bit. So hopefully it's been interesting and awesome. yeah, if people want to learn more about Revive Stronger, uh, revivestronger.com has our articles, has the podcast, um, has our member site and any of our products are over there. Um, so that's probably the best place to head and then on Instagram is probably where I'm most active. And if they want to kind of talk to me, they can message me over there and that's just revive stronger. Um, yeah.
thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.